So let us continue our discussion on the sequential quadratic programming. And the name will become clear in a bit why it's called sequential quadratic programming. But, uh, but I want to start with some discussion on what exactly is this method trying to do. So we have a constraint optimization problem of this type. Minimize fx such that hx equal to 0, gx less than equal to 0. And we want to transform this problem into an unconstrained minimization problem so that if we solve the unconstrained minimization problem, we get the solution to the original problem, okay? And the idea is, uh, and this was something that became clear in my head after talking to Matthew after the previous class, was that we want to create another unconstrained minimization problem where the set of minima, the set of local minimum is preserved in the unconstrained problem. In the other, in other words, when I formulate the unconstrained problem, it shouldn't be the case that I add new local minimums that weren't there in the original problem. Okay, and the reason for that is if I have if my original problem had two minimum, two local minimums, and I created an unconstrained problem that had three local minimums, now I have to figure out which one is not a local minimum of the original problem. So if I solve the unconstrained problem and I, come, I converse to a local minimum, I don't know whether that is a local minimum in the original problem or not. Okay, so the goal is to come up with an minimum of some function x in Rn such that the local minimum are preserved. Local minimum are preserved, okay? And that's what the idea of unconstrained, of, of sequential quadratic programming is. So I want to solve a simpler problem first, not a simpler problem. So I'm going to give you results for uh, different, so, so okay, so I'm going to prove a sequence of results in today's class um, and also come up with the sequential quadratic program to solve problems of this type. But I'm going to start with a specific problem and then see how it generalizes to more general problems of this type. Okay, so is the idea clear? So we'll start with a simple problem and then we'll see how to generalize it to this particular problem in its full-blown generality. So here is the idea. I want to start with this problem. I want to minimize f of x such that h of x equal to 0. x is in Rn. Okay. And the unconstrained problem would be I want to minimize x in Rn, f of x plus c, p of x, where p of x is defined as max of absolute value of h1 of x, hm of x. Okay, c is some constant greater than 0. Yes. So are we assuming regularity of the local minimum? Because I yes. know that in uh, inequality constraints, the constraints h of x, or the uh, gradients of h of x, uh, may not be linearly independent. Uh, is that true? Yes, that is true. So in general, it may not be linearly independent, but we will always assume regularity in, in this particular class because we are always going to fall back to Lagrange multiplier theory to explain some results, yeah. <clears throat> okay, now the question is, 
Under what conditions would the unconstrained minimum of this problem corresponds to a local minimum of this constrained problem? Okay, so I am going to assume that the second order sufficient conditions are satisfied. Okay, so the second derivative of the Lagrangian at the optimal point is uh, positive definite along Vx star. Okay, so what's the claim? The claim is if C is greater than summation absolute value of lambda i star i equals 1 to m, then unconstrained local minimum of fx plus cpx is a local minimum of star and this is my star. Let's draw a picture. The picture is as follows. Here is my h of x equal to 0 manifold. And here is my x star. And I draw a ball of radius epsilon um, around x star. And I want, what I want to prove is that if I minimize this function which is fx plus cpx if I minimize this function in this neighborhood x star is a local minimum of this function okay so that means that and remember that by hypothesis x star is an optimal solution a, a, a local minimum to this particular optimization constrained optimization problem yes so are we saying before, before the step that the local all minima are preserved, mm -hmm. are, are we saying that uh, claim is subsumed in the claim we're proving? Or are we saying that it's by inspection of what P of X and C are, uh, that uh, no matter uh, what C is, so long as it's positive, no, no. Oh. we're not going to add local minima. So if C, okay, if C is greater than something, then this result holds. I don't know whether it's the other way or not. So if x star is a local minimum of this and c is greater, so let's say c is greater than this. If x star is a local minimum of this, then the unconstrained local minimum is equal to x star. So I think the, the, this fact is implicit in this claim, okay? So I start with a local minimum and then I show that this, the local unconstrained minimum of this is the same as the local minimum of the original problem. Yes? Are we trying to work around the naivete of the previous class where you said P of X is the maximum of all the constraints? Because that makes it a, a non-differentiable function. Right? Yes, it's, not, it's a non-differentiable function. Okay, so that's, yes. that's a problem, but we're going to work around it. Is yes, we'll get a work around it. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. So right now it's not a quadratic program, right? It's, it's, an, it's just a minimization problem, but we will somehow solve this minimization problem by solving a sequence of quadratic program, okay? So we'll get to it in a bit. We're not there yet. Okay, any other question? Okay, so first, yeah, what, so yes. H of X, is that our active constraint right now? Yes, H of X is the active constraint. Okay. It's always active. So, First, I'm going to define B epsilon of X star as X such that X minus X star is less than epsilon. And then I'm going to define P of U, which is 
minimum of fx such that hx equals to u and x is in b epsilon x star and I need u epsilon u such that there exist x in b epsilon x star such that hx equals to u. Okay, so these are the three uh, three definitions we would need in order to prove the result. Okay, and what do we want to prove? So to prove, so assuming that C is going to be large, uh, I want to prove that X star equals to argument of fx plus c px x in b epsilon x star. This is what we want to prove. Yes? Is the PU minimization statement supposed to be reminiscent of the stability theorem we covered earlier? Sensitivity theorem. Sensitivity yes, theorem. yes, okay. yes okay. it is exactly that. Okay. So I have inf of x in B epsilon x star fx plus c px. Oh, I, you know, maybe you're not able to differentiate between my small p and my capital P. So how do I, uh, okay, capital P, I'll put a, so this, this denotes capital P, okay. So fx plus cpx, that's equal to inf over u in u epsilon inf over hx equals to u x in b epsilon x star fx plus c max over i hi of x. Okay, so I just added an intermediate variable u. So I take hx equal to u, I added an intermediate variable u, and then I take infimum over all such u in u epsilon. And then suddenly we've taken our, what was supposed to be our unconstrained opposition problem, and we constrained. Well, we have not really, so this is a local unconstrained problem, right? Because you can go in any direction around x star. Right, but we oh, here, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and I've, I've used a trick, very useful trick in optimization, which is add an intermediate variable and then take infimum over that intermediate variable. Okay, so you recover the original problem. Okay, so that's magic, optimization magic. Okay, so let's try to solve this problem, or, or not solve, but let's try to uh, massage this problem a little bit. So I know that hx is equal to u, so I'm taking max over i, absolute value of hi of x. 
So I can replace this by absolute value of ui. So back to your bit about the magic term. Uh, um, why are you saying that uh, the infimum um, of, of that statement will give us the uh, x star we need to prove? Oh, there's still a lot of steps in between. Okay. So we are just in the intermediate steps. You can think of this as step one of the proof. OK, so this will become inf of hx equal to u x in b epsilon x star fx plus c max over i absolute value of ui. OK. Now, this doesn't depend on x. OK. So I just have to perform this infimum over this function. And we have just defined that function here, which is small p of, small p of u. So let me make that substitution. And what I have is in over u in u epsilon p u plus c max of absolute value of ui. OK, let me just write max over i to reduce the letter. And I'm going to call this function pc of u. And this is equal to infimum u in u epsilon pc of u. OK? Largest lower bound. No, I don't think I would put it that way. It's kind of confusing. Um, th okay, th I don't know what would be an appropriate terminology, but what I would say is this is a non differentiable function of u. And of course, I have, we haven't characterized the set u epsilon, so what this set looks like, it's just written in a pretty abstract fashion. So all the values that hx takes in this particular ball. Okay. Uh, but this is an intermediate step. We don't, this is just something in between that we need to do in order to get to this particular statement, which doesn't involve any of the P, any of this PU or any of this PC of U. Yeah. So I understand how we could pull out the C uh, max of absolute value of UI, mm -hmm. but then how can we say that the infimum of F of X over certain bounds is the min of F of X? Over those bounds? Oh, uh, I see what the problem is. OK, I'll just change that to inf. So the, the book uses min, so that's why I just copied min. But yes, you're right that since this is an open set, I can't really talk about min yet unless I prove that there exists a minimum within the set. By the way, even if minimum exists, and I have infimum here, I can just replace it with the minimum because I know that the minimum exists. So, 
It was just a could we say that same thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other question on this? Okay. Could you explain again what large uh, u of epsilon means? Large, so remember I have this ball of epsilon, radius epsilon around x star. I can compute the value of hx here. I can compute the value of hx at all these points. And u is the set of all such values. Okay, sorry, u epsilon is the set of all such u's. Uh, okay, let me rewrite it in another way, which might make it clear. So union of hx over x in b epsilon x. Does that make it easier for you to understand? It's the set of all hx in the set in that yeah epsilon ball around x star. And those are the x values, which are the difference between the uh, okay, that's the x yeah. ball. Okay. okay. So I pick all the values in the ball, and I compute what the value of hx is, and I take the entire set of such values, and that's my u epsilon. Any other question? Okay, so step one is complete. There are multiple steps, so it's only step one so far. Uh, Step one gives me another. Uh, it gives me another inequality, which is f x plus c p x is greater than equal to p c of u if h x equal to u and x minus x star is less than epsilon. Okay, and this inequality is useful later on. What we are going to show eventually is that u equal to zero is actually infimizing this function. Okay, so that's the next claim. So uh, this is, I don't know, step two. In step two, I'm going to prove that PCU is greater than or equal to PC0 for all u in u epsilon. Of course, I'm making the assumption that C is greater than this number. Okay, so what I'm saying is this infimum is actually achieved at u equal to zero. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm claiming in step two. So let's see how do we prove that. So I have p of u equal to p of zero minus, so this is from sensitivity theorem. Sensitivity VT theorem implies PU is equal to P0 minus U transpose lambda star. This is little p, so this doesn't have the bar underneath p. This is little p uh, plus O U. This is small o of u. Okay, so I use the Taylor series approximation, and remember that sensitivity theorem said that gradient of p at zero is equal to negative lambda star. This is what sensitivity theorem said. Okay. So sensitivity theorem required the second order sufficient condition to be satisfied by the optimization problem. So we are essentially using all the assumptions we made on the initial optimization problem we started with.
Okay, any question? Yes. Can you explain again why little o of the norm of u approaches zero? Uh, no, it's, this is the second order term in u. Okay, so when you do the Taylor series expansion, okay, so what is, what is exactly this term? This term is 1 over 2 factorial u transpose p uh, something u. Okay, what is that something? Let me just write it as some alpha bar u. Okay, so this is the second order term in the Taylor series expansion. Okay, and this is of the order of u square. Right, so this is of the order of u square. So in optimization, we write it as small o of u. Okay. So what, what this means is, if u is small, then this term dominates this term. Okay, that's what it means. So now I can figure out PC of u, which is equal to P of u plus C max of ui, max over i. So this is equal to P of 0 minus u transpose lambda star plus c max of ui plus small o of norm of u. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, now what I'm going to show you is that this term is strictly greater than zero. So let's see what that is. Uh, let me, okay, so C max ui plus, not plus, minus, minus summation of lambda i star ui, i equals 1 to m. This is equal to, or it's strictly greater than, summation of absolute value of lambda i star max over ui minus summation of lambda i star ui. Okay. Okay, so I showed you that this is strictly positive because this term is greater than C minus, uh, not greater than, but um, this is of course greater than or equal to zero 
but we have a little bit more okay uh, we have a little bit more so I'm going to add another term here which is C minus summation of lambda I star absolute value max of ui i equals 1 to m oh no there is no summation okay and this term is of course positive and it will be equality here and what else nothing okay so that plus c minus summation of lambda i star max of ui uh, that's it okay so we'll which is strictly greater than zero or rather I should say strictly greater than C minus summation of lambda I star max of absolute value of UI. Which is zero. Which is strictly greater than zero. But I need this inequality. I need this inequality for sure. Okay, so what I have showed is, look at this expression uh, of PC of U. So this term is negligibly small for small values of U. And this term is greater than equal to this big, this big value. So let me write it here as C minus this is too low so people will not be able to see it so let me just write it as p of 0 plus p of 0 plus c minus summation lambda i star max of ui plus o of u which is greater than p of 0. Yes? I think I lost it somewhere. Can you uh, explain again why c minus the summation of the absolute values of the eigenvalues are is greater than 0? Oh, so this is by assumption. Look at this assumption. Oh, okay. Right? So if c is greater than summation of lambda i, these are not eigenvalues, these are We're not eigenvalues, Lagrange multipliers. multipliers. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. So that's Okay, so let me draw the arrow. This implies this. Okay, so I want you to look at step two again, now that everyone has noted it down. So I wanted to prove this result. Okay, so I do the Taylor series expansion of uh, the variable the function p of u i use sensitivity theorem to substitute the gradient of p at 0 to negative lambda star here then i notice that i can compute pc of u by substituting p of u here which gives me this long expression only to realize that actually this part in the middle, the two terms actually sum to something which is strictly positive and is a function of ui. Okay, and now this term dominates the second order term if epsilon is sufficiently small. If epsilon is sufficiently small, then this term dominates this term, and so this big expression is actually strictly greater than p of zero. 
Okay, so this proves the claim that PC of u is greater than or equal to PC of zero, because PC, by the way, PC of zero is actually equal to P of zero. Okay. Any question? Yes, there are two questions. Are those uh, Lagrange multiplier uh, the multiplier of the original FX problem? Or the FX plus CPX? No. So FX plus CPX is an unconstrained problem. Okay. So there is no Lagrange multiplier of FX plus CPX. So it's the Lagrange multiplier of the original problem you started with. But at this point, we don't know. We don't know. Yes. So we'll keep increasing the value of C in the final algorithm. Okay, we'll get to it in a bit. Yes. Yes, all these U's are small U's. P of zero is. So what's your question? P. Oh, it's small P. It's this is all small P because I don't have this this thing in the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so these are all small p's. Everything is small here. By the way, I also want to ask you guys, what is pc of zero? This is actually equal to f of x star. Okay, so Sorry? Yeah, that concludes the proof. Uh, but I, I'll still want to conclude all the terms together. So I'm going to erase this part. So no questions on this part? I mean, we are, we are, at, we are going to prove it uh, in a minute. OK, so what I have is fx plus cpx is greater than equal to PC of u uh, if hx is equal to u and x minus x star is less than epsilon, which is greater than equal to PC of zero. Or actually, I shouldn't write greater than equal to because it's strict inequality. So PC of u is strictly greater than PC of zero, which is equal to fx star plus px star. Because px star is equal to 0, right? So this term is equal to 0. So it's just equal to fx star. So which means that x star is unconstrained local minimum of fx plus c px when c is sufficiently large. If c is sufficiently large. Yes? And to clarify, that's the x star of the original fx. Yes, this x star is of the original fx. So this is the x star. Okay. Okay, so now we have the problem. Okay, so what we have done is we started with a constrained minimization problem. We proved this claim, which said that, oh, look, the optimal solution of the constrained problem is actually an unconstrained local minimum of, uh, of a different problem. But now, uh, so, so, so that's good. So now I can apply gradient descent. But then you come back and tell me that look, p of x star, or p of x is not, oh, this is capital P. This is capital P. So you come back and tell me that look, p of x is not a differentiable function. So what do we do? Okay, we can't apply gradient descent. So here is the next trick. Uh, 
Um, and for the next trick, I am going to make a small change. So I'm going to consider this function, fx such that g of x is less than or equal to 0, for which the p of x is defined as max of 0 g1 of x gr of x. And then I have fx plus c px as max of fx, fx plus g1x, fx plus grx. Now you would ask what happened to the equality constraint. So this is a more general formulation where I'm going to transform hx equal to zero as hx less than or equal to zero and negative hx less than or equal to zero. Okay, so by making this transformation, you can get the minimization of a function subject to equality and inequality constraint into this standard format. Okay, it's forbidden in some algorithms, but in this algorithm, it's completely fine to do that. Yes? Why is it forbidden in some algorithms? Because you need to have an interior point where hx, so for instance, in the barrier method, you couldn't do this because in the barrier method, you need to have an interior point where all the inequalities are, acti are inactive. Okay. So you have a point gx strictly less than zero. But here, it's not needed. Yes? The C? Yeah, that's right here. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, yes, that's right. So there is a C missing here and a C missing here. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so what happens in gradient descent? So in the gradient descent, we take the first order feasible variation and then we try to find a, find a, direction d where the function is minimized. So let's take fx plus d plus c, px plus d. That's given by max of, what do we do? We have fx plus gradient fx transpose d plus small o of norm of d square. I have uh, fx plus gradient fx transpose d plus, plus c g1x plus c gradient g1 x transpose t plus small o of d square and dot dot dot.
Okay, so I did the first order uh, Taylor series decomposition of each of these functions inside the maximum. So I get some small of small o of d square term, and then rest of it is just the usual first order Taylor series expansion of each of these constraints. And then I want to minimize uh, I want to write it succinctly, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, let me write it I want to minimize over all d with maximum over fx plus gradient fx transpose t fx plus gradient fx transpose d plus c g1x plus c gradient g1x transpose t plus one half d transpose h d h is strictly positive definite and this minimum is d over r n Yes. So remember in the unconstrained minimization, we usually take h to be the second derivative of the function. Um, but when you don't want to compute the second derivative, you just add an h term here in order to make sure that when you solve this minimization problem with respect to d, what you get is a finite d, not an infinite d. Yeah. So let's go back to unconstrained minimization. Okay. So I have minimized fx plus d transpose gradient of fx d in Rn. What's the solution to this problem? That d is just the opposite. D will be ma equal to negative infinity gradient of fx. Right. So we don't want this negative infinity term. So I just add a positive definite matrix, so I get a well-defined. Now, of course, if h was closer to the second derivative of this function, then we would get an exact Newton's method, right? But we don't want to do Newton's method yet. Okay? So we have used this trick several times in the class now to have uh, some h positive definite uh, with d transpose h d term added in the end. Now what you see is a min max problem, okay? Minimum over d, maximum over several values. So how do we solve this problem? So this is ag an, again another cool trick in optimization, so I want you all to pay attention. I am going to solve this problem. Minimize fx plus gradient fx transpose d plus half d transpose h d plus c c okay so i added another term c here so this minimization is over d and c where c is greater than equal to 0 and g j x plus is less than equal to c for all j equals 1 to r. Okay. 
okay it turns out that these two problems are equivalent yes sorry, did you say the stuff in red is the solution no it's not the solution it's part of the constraint so okay. you have two constraints okay these are the constraints Oh, actually, FX doesn't participate in the optimization, so I'm going to just cross this out because the argument of D doesn't depend on the value of FX. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so we started with a constraint problem. We transformed it into an unconstrained minimization problem. We realize that the unconstrained minimization problem is not differentiable, so we can't really do gradient descent. But then we did some magic, and we came up with a sequence of quadratic programming that if we solve, we converse to the optimal solution to the original problem. Uh, what's the explanation for why those two are equivalent problems? You know, I unfortunately don't have time today, so I'll go over the equivalence in the next class. Okay, so I just want to cover the high level ideas in this class. Uh, but it's a good thing to think about why should these two problems be equivalent? Okay, you should think about it. Um, okay, so where were we? Yeah, so we were, uh, so we started with an unconstrained problem. Sorry, we started with a constrained problem, we converted into an unconstrained problem. Uh, if we have equality constraint, we can still, we can reduce that equality constraint into a sequence of inequality constraints. So anyways, this problem is what we eventually want to solve. Uh, in order to solve this problem, we came up with this, this uh, unconstrained minimization, so objective function for the unconstrained minimization. C has to be sufficiently large for this, okay, so we'll talk about how to get sufficiently large C in the next class. And then we wanted to do gradient descent for finding the appropriate direction D in which this function is minimized. So in order to do that, we did the first order Taylor series approximation of the objective function. We removed all these terms, O of D squared terms because they are going to be small, my distance d is going to be small. And then I came up with a quadratic program. So this is a quadratic program because you have d transpose h d term, you have a linear function of d, a linear function of c. c has to be non-negative, but d could be in Rn, so d could be in Rn. And then these constraints must be satisfied for all j. Okay. Um, once you get d star from here, then you just take xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk star. So, of course, you replace x with xk everywhere. So, this x will be xk, this x will be xk, this x will be xk. And then we get dk star. And then we pick an appropriate value of alpha k using Armijo's rule or limited minimization rule or whatever, right? And then I iterate, get xk plus 1, plug it in here. So I have gradient of fxk plus 1, gjxk plus 1, the gradient at xk plus 1. Solve this optimization problem, get dk plus 1 star, okay, and continue. So this is a sequential quadratic programming because you are solving a sequence of quadratic program in order to find an unconstrained minimum of this problem, which happens to be a solution to this constrained minimization problem. Okay, now I'll talk about how to pick an appropriate value of C and why are these two problems equivalent in the next class. Thank you. Can you turn on the video?